Welcome to Mountain View. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're new or this is your church home, you can find everything Mountain View on our hub at mtnvw.org hub. There you'll find info on giving, life groups, and kids. If you're new or have a prayer request, make sure to click the connect button. Stay in touch during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Before service starts, we want to give you an idea of what to expect. We will begin by singing a few songs together with the purpose of glorifying God through praise and worship. The lyrics will be displayed, and we will invite everyone to sing along. Following our songs, one of our teaching pastors will share a message about the good news in a relatable way, with the hope of growing our faith and understanding of God. Finally, we will take communion and sing again as a response to God's goodness. We also have programming for kids and students throughout the week. You can find more information about this on mtnvw.org. Whether you are online or in person, we are so glad you're here. Let's get ready to worship. Good morning, Mountain View. We're so glad to have you here. Will you stand and join us in worship? We're going to celebrate this morning. We're going to dance and clap, so feel free to join us for any of it, part of it. If you're worshiping online, stand up and dance with us. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I tried to pull my but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of Just when I.
Mountain View. Thank you. It's nice to hear a response. It is so good to see all of you here in person or online. We are so glad that you are here. If you are in person, there are some connect cards on the backs of your seats. So if you wouldn't mind, if you would like to connect with somebody here at the church or introduce yourself, or you have a prayer request, please fill those cards out online. You can connect as well. So this morning, if you can't tell, we are in a celebratory mood. It feels good. I think many of us have a little bit of a nervous anticipation for our new lead pastor, and we are just excited and anxious uh, for him to join us coming up soon. And I am just reminded when I think about um, that excitement that's building, just how God was in all of it and how he was just good and present through the entire process. And I'm so thankful for that in that process, and I'm thankful for that in my life. And I think that there are just so many times where I could look back and remember how God was good. And I encourage all of you to hold on to that when things don't look so good, because our circumstances will continue to change, but God does not. And Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So he will always be with us. So please continue to join us with our worship. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your steadfast spirit. We praise you in the good times. We praise you when things are tough. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us. Please be here with us this morning. Let us feel your presence. Let our voices, let our music be pleasing to you. In your beautiful name, amen.
about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong
pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for being life-changing. Thank you for giving us so much to celebrate. God, we know that you use all things for good. And we just pray this morning that you will bless everyone who's here, who's online. God, that what we give back to you, you will use for your good, Jesus. Thank you for everything that you do in our lives every single day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is not after your time, talent, or treasures. He is after your heart. Our desire is to help each person know Jesus and to be more like him. We believe we are most like Jesus when we have a desire to give. Growing in the grace of giving is a part of growing spiritually. You can give by going to mtnvw.org give, texting the amount to the number on the screen, or by mail to 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway. Thank you for your ongoing generosity. Mountain View family. How are we doing today? Good. That's really good to hear. It's not raining, so I'll take it, right? Like, this is great. It was sunny this morning. Fingers crossed. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us today, whether here in person or at home online. Um, it's going to be a wonderful day. Before we get started, I didn't want to say, I don't know if anybody noticed, there's a special guest in the room. Pastor Ken and Tanya are here today. I know, right? He was in the foyer, and I almost didn't recognize him because he was so tan. Uh, tan is relative, but, you know, you get it. You get it. We're glad that they're here, so be sure to say hi to them before you go today. We are continuing our series called Established. We are in the book of Acts. You could easily call this book Luke part two, because they kind of go together, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. This is such a great book and an important story in our lives, and as we come to understand the early church, how they got their start, and how the message of Jesus Christ went from the Middle East to the ends of the earth. And Luke is calling all of us to follow Jesus on this path that leads to real life. And that's all well and good, but if you've ever tried to be on this path, you know that this path is not an easy one, right? It comes with a lot of hardships. And I think it's mostly hard because it asks us to do something that doesn't come naturally to us as humans, which is to deny ourselves. That's not an easy thing to do if you're a human being living and breathing, to deny yourselves and to live by the example that Jesus set for us. Hard. Life was already hard before you were asked to be selfless and to deny yourself. And so as you're going to see as the early church starts to, you know, spread its wings and to have some inroads, this was easier said than done. The book of Acts is a great book for a lot of reasons. One of the things that I think stands out about this book is you get to see some of the highs and lows that the early church discovered, and you come to realize that there really is nothing new under the sun, that they were trying to grow a church and to be faithful to God's calling in the midst of a lot of hardships. There was social and political unrest as a result of the spread of the gospel, not to mention things like wars, a betrayal trails and personal conflicts, sounds like right now. There was also a lot of really God moments. It wasn't all bad all the time. There was a lot of really great things that God did and took place in this story. Moments where it was obvious that God was and is at work in the lives of his church and of his people. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you come to find out that it was God's will for the message of Jesus to spread to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what has happened and what continues to happen today. 
So we're going to continue our series in Acts. We're going to be in chapter 3, for those of you who have your Bibles or will be on the screen. I really love this verse. I, f- I feel like I say that a lot. <laughs> Side note. I feel like I say, this verse is really good. All the verses are really good. You really can't. I mean, just take your pick. They're all wonderful. This one is particularly good because it's the one I'm talking about right now. But all the verses are great. <laughs> this verse is really good for a lot of reasons. At, the, at this point in the life of the church, you're going to start to hear a little bit of a leaning toward a Jewish audience because, I don't know if you know this, but all of the first Christians were Jews. All of them. All of the first Christians, that's where it started, right? So you're going to hear our, our folks today talking about, uh, talking specifically to a Jewish audience. They're Jewish in heritage and religion, and so you're going to see the apostles and all of these converts being in places where the Jewish community would naturally gather. Now, that eventually, as we keep going on through Acts, you're going to start to see that widen, this gradual transition from a Jewish Christianity to a whole body of believers that encompasses both Jews and Gentiles, which is going to be the rest of us, which is really, really great. But that doesn't happen overnight, and that came with a lot of struggles. And in chapter 3, we are reintroduced to some familiar faces, some characters that we've heard before. Peter and John, um, really, really wonderful men. I guess if there was any such a thing as a bestie in the Bible, they're probably pretty close. Peter and John have been through a lot together. They owned a fishing business before or Jesus called them to be fishers of men. They follow Jesus as part of the original 12 disciples. They prepared the last Passover meal for Jesus. And then in an interesting moment in John's gospel, they both race to be the first to the empty tomb of Jesus on that first Easter. And John makes a point to let you know that he won the race. Okay, in case you were wondering. He's like, and I won because I'm awesome. Great. And now here they are, filled with the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost. And they're working together to get the early church started. Chapter 3. Three is this really cool high moment in the story of Acts. What comes in the future chapters, this is when it starts to get really difficult. So this thing that's going to take place today sets into motion other things that are not so great that are going to happen for the early believers in the first church. So Acts chapter 3 verse 1 says this, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. So three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So picture it. Peter and John head to the temple during a time of prayer and sacrifice, so a very busy time when a lot of people would be there. And apparently they're not the only ones who go to the temple during this time. A man comes who has been crippled since birth, a lame man who fully relied on the kindness of strangers to make enough money to survive, comes and begs at the same time every day, a time when people were going to be around and would probably, frankly, be more inclined to give. Because one of the the tenets of the Jewish faith is charity. So you're going to pray and to offer sacrifices, and you see this man, and you probably are a little bit more charitable than you would be. Now, there are some disagreements among theologians as to where exactly this gate known as beautiful was, but most scholars agree that the gate was, in fact, beautiful. It was this bronze-coated high wall, and when the light hit it just right, it shone like gold, and it was just amazing. It's probably this interesting contrast to this lame beggar sitting on the ground amongst this beautiful, ornate wall or this gate. And so here we are in this moment. Most of the people who came to the temple probably didn't even give this man, like, a a second glance. They probably didn't even, like, look up to him. He was, like, saying his thing. They're like, oh, here's a coin. As they walked on to their, you know, whatever is more important as they tossed a coin. But Peter does something really interesting here. He asks for the man's total attention, which you're going to see. And the man looks up at Peter, and almost comically, (laughs) Peter is going to say (laughs) something that I thought was funny when I first read it. Maybe you won't find it as funny. In verse 4, he says this, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. (laughs) Which I just think is funny because he's like, yes, like you just took up my whole life. And so, yes, I'm looking at you. You have my undivided attention. He goes, I ain't got no money for you. And if I was him, I would think to myself, then get out of the way. What are you doing, guy? Like, get out. Like, I'm trying to (laughs) make some money here. Move on, move on, move on. But he says, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk 
and taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. What the man needed most wasn't money, wasn't stuff, but salvation for his soul and healing for his body. And here we have our first healing miracle that isn't technically performed by Jesus. And I say technically because Peter does heal the man, but I want you to notice something really important. He doesn't heal the man by his own will, but by the name of Jesus. He says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. He doesn't say, by my own ability, get up. (laughs) Those are two very different statements. It's almost like how Jesus interacted and performed his ministry in relation to his father, God. Jesus was always really good at saying, it's not my will, but the will of the one who sent me. In that same kind of vein, Peter says, it's not my will, but the will of the one who sent me. In the name of the one who sends me, walk. From a biblical perspective, a name is far more than what you're called. That's kind of how we see names, or maybe it's a way to get some official ID that says who you are, but it was so much more than that from a biblical perspective. It's an extension of your identity, part of who you are, your very being. So to call on the name of anyone, or specifically to call on the name of Jesus, is to do something under that name's authority or power. And how is it that the name of Jesus could have so much power? It's a very important thing. It's because Jesus is a living God. He's a living God. His resurrection means that death has been overcome, and as a result, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. We're talking about a living God who conquered death in the grave. So that name comes with a lot of power. Jesus himself, before he ascends to heaven, speaks as much in Matthew's gospel. All authority in heaven and earth has now been given to me. I have all the authority and the power. One of of all the miracles that kind of take place in Acts that you're going to read about, this one most closely resembles the miracles of Jesus that are recorded in the Gospels, even down to on whose authority these miracles were performed. When it was Jesus, it was by his own authority. Here when it's Peter, it's also by Jesus' authority. It's the same person's authority. So yes, it wasn't Jesus in the flesh who performed the miracle, but technically it's still Jesus' authority that allows this miracle to happen. Now here's what takes place in verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising, and I can only imagine a man who has been crippled, not just like getting up like, oh, I bet he walked and leaped and skipped and did all the things that he was never able to do almost like a child playing on a playground, just enjoying this new movement that he's never had. And when all the people saw him doing these things, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Now, What's really more amazing than the miracle itself is what the miracle means for this man's life, right? He can do the things that he couldn't do before. He can stand up and walk. Think of the long-term implications of his physical life and his physical future. He doesn't have to beg anymore. He is now able-bodied. But more importantly than that is the spiritual implications of this man's ability to walk. He is now deemed worthy enough to enter the temple courts and worship God. It was a thing he couldn't do before. He just had to stand at the gate, lay at the gate. Now he can stand up and walk and worship. The entire book of Acts, as you come to find out, tells a very, very similar story. This idea that those who were considered unclean or unworthy in the old covenant approach to God are now, because of Christ, deemed worthy. And it doesn't matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what your background is, and you're going to come to find that out, whether you're lame or you're sick, whether you're an Ethiopian eunuch, whether you're a slave, whether you're a woman, whether you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. Whatever was said, whatever and whoever said you were unworthy or you're unclean, all that's been wiped away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now all have access to God. And when you start to see this story through that lens, you start to see the very natural parallels that take place in our own story of salvation, what that looks like. You see, this man was born broken. 
as we are, okay? This man was poor and was unable to pay his debts, as we are when it comes to the debt for sin. As a result, he had to sit outside the temple, apart from God, in that same way that our sin separates us from God. Then the man was healed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, as are we, and he gave all of the onlookers at the temple the evidence that he had been healed by praising God, as do we? Hmm. I'm not so sure about that last one. All the other things kind of parallel, and you can see it. But I'm not always 100% sure about that last one all the time. I mean, here's the reality. I like to praise God, right? But I like to do it in the comfort of my own home or in the safety of church walls with like-minded people. But this lame man in this story was worshiping God out loud. Out loud. He wanted everyone to know that he had been forever changed, See, here's the thing. Now that the lame man can stand, there wasn't a doubt by anybody who was seeing him who he stood for. And here is my question for you, the believers in this room. Now that you've been saved, who do you stand for? Is it obvious by the onlookers in our cultural context by the way you praise God? Not in this room, not in the comfort of your own home, but out loud. Is it obvious to them? It's an important question because when you think about all of the chaos that's going on in our world, like I said, there's nothing new under the sun, same similar chaos was taking place in the early church. When you think about all of the chaos going on in our modern context, I feel like sometimes we like to just stand up and say, who is the new standard bearer? Who's going to be the one who stands for holiness and righteousness? Is there one person out there who will do the right thing in the midst of the chaos? And do you know what God's answer would be? To put a mirror in front of your face and say, you, you are supposed to be the standard bearer, Christian. You are the living, breathing testimony of the gift of grace that I gave the entire world through my son, Jesus Christ. It's you. It's you. Because the best testimony of the power of Jesus to forgive sins is a changed life. It's a changed life. Always has been, always will be. So don't wait for somebody else to do it. You do it. You're the standard bearer. You're the evidence, the proof that Jesus is alive and well. Now at this point in the story, a large crowd has gathered, right? Because they're in awe, complete awe of this lame man who can walk. And Peter sees this, like a good preacher would, as a prime time to preach a sermon. Oh, I've got an audience. Let's go. Let's do it. Oh, man. And there's a lot of parallels because this is not the first sermon that Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. There was this moment where the Spirit came down and filled the people, and then all of a sudden Peter preaches this amazing sermon. Thousands of people come to know Christ. It's a great moment. Okay, so you're going to start to see parallels between these two sermons. Both sermons start by giving a correction of a false impression of what had just happened. In this particular moment, the people who were gathered thought that Peter had healed the man of his own free will. So he has to correct that at the beginning of his sermon. Peter gives a statement about God glorifying Jesus at the same time holding God's people responsible for Jesus' death. He does that in both sermons. In the day of Pentecost sermon, he does that. He does it here again, so that's a similarity. He again brings up the apostles' witness to the resurrection of Jesus and then follows that up with extensive proof from the prophets of the Old Testament that Jesus was the real deal. All of these guys have been talking about Jesus. You just didn't notice. You weren't paying attention. But here's where you can see it. So that's kind of the crux of the sermon, both sermons. That's where they have the similarities. But what I want to point out here is some differences, some things to note in this sermon that are unique to this sermon. And the first is found in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 3. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. In the prior verses, Peter has just blamed the Jewish people for the death of Jesus. But he didn't leave the Jews without any hope. In fact, he points out that the betrayal of Jesus by the Jews was both out of ignorance 
and was foretold in scriptures. In fact, in John's gospel, chapter one, he spells it out quite, quite bluntly. He says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, his own people, but his own did not receive him. God chose and sent and exalted Jesus. He came first to his own people and they rejected him, which was sinful, even if it was done in ignorance. So here's the thing that I want you to glean from this. If the best testimony to the world is that Jesus has the power to change a life, then the best testimonies also tell others the truth about sin. You have to. Think about it. For the whole reason, the whole reason Jesus had to die, frankly, the whole reason why Jesus even had to be sent here, for that matter, is because humanity has a sin problem. That's not a popular opinion. doesn't make it any less true. And you can't possibly be a living testimony to the power of Jesus to save a life unless you also tell people what you're being saved from. You have to. It, it, they go together. It's all part of it. Salvation, we think of as good news, but it's kind of a bad news, good news situation. The bad news, you're a sinner. The good news, there's a way out. And Jesus is that way out. So what is it that Peter suggests to the Jewish people that they do? And this is the other thing that kind of stands apart in this sermon. He suggests that they repent. Take a listen to verse 19 and 20. He says, repent then <laughs> and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. I'm not Peter by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and preach a get-it-together sermon, especially since I'm just as guilty of sin. And my sin is also a part of what put Christ on the cross. So it's mine too. This is mine to own as well. But I think that Peter is onto something with this whole repentance thing. It's a big fancy word, but it simply means the ability to change your mind about yourself, about Jesus, about sin. I don't know that we so often, this is that deny yourself moment. I think when we kind of have in our minds the way the world should work, the way we work within the world, it's hard to change our minds. But repentance requires it. It says you have to be willing, if you're going to be a follower of me, to have your mind changed about me. Your mind changed about you. You think you have it all figured out? You don't. So if you're going to be my follower, you got to be ready to repent. And repentance requires you to be willing to have your mind changed. It's more than remorse. That's what you need to hear. It's more than remorse. It's more than I'm sorry. It's more than even shame. It's more than all those things. True repentance is admitting that what God says about you is true. What he says about you, the good and the bad, is true. And because it's true, you decide to change your mind about your sin and change your actions toward God. That's what repentance is. It's hard. It's like the hardest part of this whole thing. Because you have to deny yourself over and over again. Or you have to admit to yourself that you could be wrong. <laughs> Nobody likes to be wrong. But you have to admit to yourself that that's a possibility. Here's the bottom line. You can't have a changed life in Christ without repentance. You can't. You can't have one. The evidence that Christ did it is a changed life. You can't have a changed life without admitting that you sin, that you missed the mark, that you're not 100% all the time, that there are things in your life that need to be different and better. So what is it that we learn or that we can glean from this story, maybe even that will carry us through the rest of the book of Acts? I think the first is this. God's will for humankind is for us to know and to love Jesus Christ. Jesus himself declared it. The disciples preached it. The church is supposed to live it. It was God's will for Jesus to come to this earth, to live among us, to die for us, to be risen from the dead for the forgiveness of sins and the reconciliation between us and God. And that is still the plan. It's still the best plan, no matter which way the world goes, in the best of times and in the worst of times. It's still the plan. And it's not easy. It's a battle. That's a lot of ways that it is described, not just in Acts, but as you continue through the New Testament, as Paul starts to speak into this thing we call the Christian life, it's a battle. He relates it to a struggle, a battle, and the battle for the souls of humankind. And that battle starts with us. It starts with us. 
We are the testimony to the world that Jesus Christ has the power to change lives. But claiming that testimony is an ongoing battle because it's a battle for the heart and it's a battle for the mind. And it's all the time, every day. And when you think about how you begin that battle, it always starts with preparation. I think sometimes people want to go out, swords flailing, and go capture the others, but you're not prepared. You're not ready yet for battle. It starts with you, your own heart, being constantly turned back to Christ. And then it is the hearts of others so that they too will turn to Christ. Here's the really good news about this, though. The battle that we fight isn't fought in our own power. In the same way that Peter did not heal this man in his own power, but in the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In his name, there's victory. In your name, there's nothing. In his name, there's victory. That this is indeed possible. Throughout the history of the church, we have experienced all the highs and lows. We've experienced the feast. We've experienced the famine, the times of great joy and growth, and the times of great sorrow, times of health, times of persecution. Most of the men that you're going to read about in the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament, they die. Horrible, horrible deaths for the sake of the gospel, including Peter. In fact, John is the only one of the originals to actually get to live to see an old age. But know that none of these things have ever stopped the gospel message from going forth. None of them. None of them. Even though it's scary. When you're in it, when it's persecution season, it's a scary season. But not even that, all throughout history, has ever stopped the spread of the gospel. You've probably heard the phrase, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I think that's very true. We have a lot to learn from the early church about how we're supposed to live and act and be in the midst of the good times and in the bad times. So we don't make poor choices. So my encouragement for you is this. As you go forth to be a living testimony, a living, breathing testimony of the goodness of God, repent. <laughs> repent. Change your mind. Be open to having your mind changed by God. Repent. Don't underestimate how God wants to use your testimony through the power of the Holy Spirit. So worship God out loud. Not just in the comfort of your own home. Not just in the safety of like-minded people, but out loud. That's a scary thing to do. Especially in our world and our culture. Not everybody's going to love that. So here's what I leave you with. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid or ashamed of the gospel, for the Lord your God is with you. He's with you. Do you believe that? He's with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this powerful and important message. We can learn so much for how the early church was, how they got started, how they got their grounding, the hard times, the good times, God, Whatever season we believe we're in, we know that you are with us. So help us to stand for you, for our lives to be a living testimony of your goodness and your faithfulness, how you can take the most broken people and the most broken pieces and put them all back together. That's what you do. And only you can do it, only through your power. So God, help us to be a living testimony. Help us to be open to having our minds changed when confronted with the truth about ourselves and who you say we are. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you have your communion elements, now would be the time to grab those. I'm really excited that we're going through this book because honestly, I don't know that a lot of people really kind of know the story of how we got started. <laughs> Sometimes it gets lost a little bit to history. And I don't mean we Mountain View, but I do mean we Mountain View, the big C church. It didn't start in this building like this with the freedoms that we enjoy today. It started way back here under a lot of persecution where we were not the majority, but the minority. And it was hard. It was really hard. But still they persevered. There are parts of this world where this kind of thing is still happening and I think it's really good for us to have some perspective about just how mighty and big our God is. Because when things are always going well all the time, sometimes we get into this place where we rely less on God and more on ourselves because we don't really need him. 
it's fine. Things are going great. Everything is just great. We're in a great season right now. Hey, enjoy those seasons because they're few and far between. But the point is you can't ever decide you don't need God because the next storm is coming. The next wave is coming. Hearing how God can move and do the miraculous in the midst of the impossible is the kind of thing we need as encouragement when things are hard. We need to be reminded that he's bigger than all of those other things, the things that keep us up at night and give us anxiety, the things that there isn't a solution for and you're not sure how you're going to get out of. You have to be reminded that God's dealt with worse and he's made it happen. This is why it's good to just take a good glance through history and get a sense for how big and how mighty our God is. And nothing was able to stop the spread of the gospel. No government, no organization, no people, nothing. And that is still true. That's still true. So today, as you take communion and you're reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross, first, let's thank God for loving us in spite of ourselves. That's always such an important thing to do in these moments as you remember his sacrifice. And let us be reminded and encouraged that he is still the one with all authority in heaven and on earth. He's still that guy that we read about. And because he is, you know he's someone you can trust with your biggest obstacle or whatever's going on in your life right now. I'm gonna pray you take your elements and let's thank him for his goodness. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, this author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you that he was willing to endure the cross, all of its shame and its suffering, so that we could know real life. Help us to never take our eyes off him, to lean into him when times are hard and in moments of persecution where we're not even sure how a way is out. You make ways where there are no ways. Maybe that's why we call you way maker. God, be that for us now, whatever's going on in our lives. In your son's name, we pray these things. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. Good morning. I guess this thing is on. I am Tony Herrera. For those who know, don't know me, I'm uh, one of the elders here at the church. Um, who can follow that? Huh? <laughs> Give him a hand again. This is a house of worship. We come here in the name of Jesus. We come here to come to know Jesus. Um, I have an announcement, an exciting, an exciting announcement for all of us. Chris, our new lead pastor, will be here with us at the end of the month. At the end of this month of, Ju of, of June. Of, I'm sorry, at the end of July, not this month of June. See, I got you excited and I got you clapping. Um, the other announcement is um, we always have someone in the prayer wall over here. For those of you who need a little prayer, for those of you who need a little encouragement, for those of you who need to be picked up from where you are, for those of you who need to be fed, come along with someone. We'll be praying for you there at that wall. Um, see, I don't know how to use this thing. Sometimes I have it way out here, and sometimes I'm eating it. Um, I want to read to you Isaiah 5, 58, 11. It says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. I pray that this week and the following weeks of our lives, of your lives, that you will extend your hand and grab Jesus' hand so that he can walk with you. That in the sunny days of your life, in the heated days of your lives, that will, you, you would embrace him and that you will feel the coolness of his presence in your heart. I do pray that you will allow him to take all the discouragement that you may have, all of the issues that you are carrying with you, all of the rocks that are weighing you down, that he will allow him to take those, that he will give you rest, that he will give you love, that he will give you an embrace that will last forever and ever. And with this, feel free to leave. You're, you're free to go. God bless you.